Hi everyone. Today we are talking about Naomi Campbell versus MGN Limited. Towards the recognition of a right to privacy under English law. Naomi Campbell, the British model who rose to fame in the 1990s as one of the six models of a generation declared supermodels, is currently being celebrated at the Victoria and Albert Museum in a delightful temporary exhibition entitled Naomi in Fashion. It is therefore the right time to delve into the most famous litigation case in which Miss Campbell was involved in, no, not that one, where she allegedly tossed a mobile phone at her maid and was consequently sentenced to five days community service and ordered to attend an anger management course. What we want to get our teeth into is the Naomi Campbell versus MGN Limited case a seven-year-old saga which contributed to the recognition of a human rights principle of privacy under English law. So on the 1st of February 2001, an article was published in the British Red Top, The Mirror, which disclosed that Naomi Campbell was a drug addict receiving therapy with Narcotics Anonymous. The article gave details of the meeting that she was attending. It was illustrated by photographs showing Miss Campbell leaving a Narcotics Anonymous meeting in the King's Road in Chelsea, London. Others with her, who were presumably leaving the same meeting, had their face pixelated. The article, marked exclusive, read, Supermodel Naomi Campbell is attending Narcotics Anonymous meetings in a courageous bid to beat her addiction to drink and drugs. The 30-year-old has been irregular at counselling sessions for three months, often attending twice a day. Dressed in jeans and baseball cap, she arrived at one of NA's lunchtime meetings this week. Hours later, at a different venue, she made a low-key entrance to a woman-only gathering of recovering addicts. Despite her £14 million fortune, Naomi is treated as just another addict trying to put her life back together. A source close to her said last night she wants to clean up her life for good. She went into modeling when she was very young and it is easy to be led astray. Drink and drugs are unfortunately widely available in the fashion world, but Naomi realized she had a problem and has bravely voted to do something about it. Everyone wishes her well. A spokeswoman at Elite Models declined to comment. Allegedly, the general turn of this article was sympathetic to Miss Campbell. Also on the 1st of February 2001, Naomi Campbell's solicitors wrote a complaint letter to the editor of the Mirror, marked private and confidential, enclosing a copy of the proceedings which had been issued that day, stating, publication of this article is a breach of confidentiality and an invasion of privacy. Please let us have your undertaking by return that firstly, you will not publish further confidential and or private information. And secondly, you will not commit any further unlawful invasions of our client's privacy. These complaints that this article invaded Naomi Campbell's privacy were made on her behalf to Mirror Group Newspaper Limited, the owner of the Mirror, which we're going to call from now on MGM Limited. In a further article published in the Mirror on the 5th of February 2001, notwithstanding Miss Campbell's solicitor's letter of 1st of February 2001, these complaints were referred to in terms which were no longer sympathetic. The second article's headline was pathetic, below which was a photograph 
with all faces pixelated except for Miss Campbell's. Underneath was the caption, Help, Naomi leaves Narcotics Anonymous meeting last week after receiving therapy in a battle against illegal drugs. The article was further headlined, After years of self-publicity and illegal drug abuse, Naomi Campbell winches about privacy. In the same edition, there is an editorial under the headline, Voice of the Mirror, entitled No Hiding Naomi, which ends with his words. If Naomi Campbell wants to live like a nun, let her join a nunnery. If she wants the excitement of a show business life, she must accept what comes with it. The second article made further reference to the fact that Miss Campbell was receiving treatment for drug abuse and contained a further photograph of her leaving the Narcotics Anonymous meeting in the previous week. This article stated, for the past three months she has been attending Narcotics Anonymous meetings to help a fighter addiction to drink and drugs. Two further unsympathetic articles were published about Miss Campbell in the Mirror on 7th and 8th of February 2001. Miss Campbell consequently brought an action against MGM Limited. She claimed damages for breach of confidence and or invasion of privacy in respect of the first two publications and relied upon the latter two publications as entitling her to aggravated damages. She also claimed that MGM Limited was in breach of duty under the Data Protection Act 1998 and that she was entitled to compensation under Section 13 of this Act. In terms of legal proceedings, the first judgment handed down was from the High Court in 2002. You can see the reference of these various judgments in our article on Naomi Kendall versus MGM Limited published on the publication section of our website, crefovi.com in English and crefovi.fr in French. In Campbell versus MGM Limited 2002, after a trial lasting five days in February 2002, Justice Morland held that Miss Campbell had established an entitlement to damages for breach of confidentiality and to compensation under the Act. Consequently, Justice Morland awarded £2,500 of damages and compensation to Naomi Campbell. The reason for the small amount of the award was that from the outset, Miss Campbell conceded that MGM Limited was entitled to publish the fact that she was a drug addict and was receiving treatment for her addiction. Her claim for damages and compensation related only to the additional information conveyed by the articles and the photographs published by MGM Limited. She submitted that the relevance of the photographs published by the Mirror was that they conveyed to the public information that was not otherwise truly obtainable, namely what the event and its participants looked like. She also submitted that the fact that those with Miss Campbell had their faces pixelated, demonstrated that ordinary people in Miss Campbell's position would have a reasonable expectation of privacy. Furthermore, she submitted that the statements that she had been attending NA meetings for three months was inaccurate since she had been attending such meetings for about two years in the United Kingdom and abroad. Moreover, the statement that Miss Campbell regularly went twice a day to group counselling was inaccurate. It greatly exaggerated the frequency of her attendance at such meetings. Justice Morland held that the two later articles belittled Miss Campbell in a highly offensive and hurtful manner in relation to a claim that these articles went beyond legitimate criticism of Miss Campbell and sounded in aggravated damages insofar as this caused increased injury to her feelings. Justice Morland assessed the consequent increments to the damages in the sum of £1,000. MGM Limited appealed this first degree judgment, challenging the judge's findings that they were in breach of duty to Miss Campbell and his award of aggravated damages. So in the same year, 2022, the Court of Appeal decision was handed down. 
After a hearing which lasted two and a half days in Campbell versus MDM Limited 2002, the appeal judges found that Naomi Campbell conceded that no complaint was made as to the publication of the bold fact that she was receiving treatment for addiction. The reason for such concessions were her acceptance that by misleading asserting to the media that she did not take drugs, she had rendered it legitimate for the media to put the record straight. The fact that an individual has achieved prominence on the public stage does not mean that their private life can be laid bare by the media. Also, this is not in the public interest. Indeed, who gives a toss whether <laughs> Naomi Campbell goes narcotics anonymous or not? The Human Rights Act 1998 has had a significant impact on the UK law of confidentiality by transposing the human rights consecrated by the European Convention of Human Rights under English law. On the one hand, when considering what information is confidential, the courts must have regards to the Article 8 rights to respect for privacy and family life. On the other hand, they must have regards to the importance of freedom of expression, particularly when it is the media that seeks to exercise this freedom. The European Court of Human Rights has repeatedly recognized that freedom of the media is a bastion of any democratic society set out in Article 10 of the Convention and Section 12.4 of the Human Rights Act reflects such appreciation. The UK courts are in the process of identifying on a case-by-case -case basis the principles by which the law of confidentiality must accommodate the Article 8 and Article 10 rights. One principle which has been recognized by the parties in this case is that where a public figure chooses to make untrue pronouncements uh, about their private life, the press will normally be entitled to put the record straight. Given that it was legitimate for MGM Limited to publish the fact that Miss Campbell was a drug addict and that she was receiving treatment, it does not seem to the appeal judges that it was particularly significant to add the fact that the treatment consisted of attendance at meetings of Narcotics Anonymous. The peripheral disclosure of Miss Campbell's attendance at NA was, in its context, not of sufficient significance to shock the conscience and justify the intervention of a court. The inaccuracies in the articles had an insignificant impact on the story as a whole because the details faded into insignificance compared to the central fact that Miss Campbell was receiving treatment for drug addiction. The publication of information of which Miss Campbell complains was not, in its context, sufficiently significant to amount to a breach of duty of confidence owed to her. The public interest and titles to publish the peripheral details and the detail that was given, and indeed the photographs, were a legitimate, if not an essential part of a journalistic package designed to demonstrate that Miss Campbell had been deceiving the public when she said that she did not take drugs. The information published by MGM Limited was justified in order to provide a factual account of Miss Campbell's drug addiction that had the detail necessary to carry credibility, provided that publication of particular confidential information is justifiable in the public interest, the journalist must be given reasonable latitude as to the manner in which that information is conveyed to the public or the Article 10 right to freedom of expression will be unnecessary and inhibited. The judgment given in Ms. Campbell's favour for breach of confidence had to be set aside. Pursuant to the Data Protection Act, when the data controller is responsible for the publication of hard copies that reproduce data that has previously been processed by means of equipment operating automatically, the publication forms part of the processing and falls within the scope of the Act. However, MGM Limited were entitled to invoke the journalism exemption provisions of Section 32 of the Data Protection Act in answer to Ms. Campbell's claim. As the details of Ms. Campbell's attendance at Narcotics Anonymous was part of a journalistic package that it was reasonable to publish in the public interest, the appeal judges did not consider that it would have been reasonably practicable to comply with the provisions of the data protection principles while at the same time making the publications in question. It followed that MGM Limited had made good they contention that the free conditions of exemption under Section 32 were satisfied. 
Consequently, there was no infringement of the Data Protection Act by MGM Limited. Therefore, in relation to damages awarded, the appeal was dismissed. With respect to the aggravated damages awarded on the base of the articles published by MGM Limited on 7th and 8th of February 2001, the appeal judges agreed with the first degree judge that the terms of these articles justified the findings made by this judge and that it would have been open to him to award aggravated damages in respect of them had his findings on liability been valid. Therefore, in relation to aggravated damages awarded, the appeal was allowed. And Miss Campbell was to pay costs of £100,000 on account of costs within 28 days and 80% of appeal costs. Consequently, the decision of Justice Morland from 2022 was reversed by the Court of Appeal in October 2022. Ms. Campbell appealed. Following a hearing of two days in Campbell versus MGM Limited 2004, handed down on the 6th of May 2004, the five Lords of Appeal for Judgment in the cause from the House of Lords opined as follows. With respect to breach of confidence and misuse of private information, while the values protected by Article 8 of the Convention, respect for private and family life, must leave room for the right to freedom of expression protected by Article 10 of the Human Rights Act and the Convention, a proportionality test should be applied, which is called the highly offensive test. In the present case, the information disclosed about Ms. Campbell relating to health matters and medical treatment may have been private in nature and therefore protectable under Article 8 of the Convention. Moreover, there is no public interest whatever in publishing to the world the fact that this citizen had a drug dependency. The Court of Appeal erred in looking at whether the disclosure would have offended the reasonable man of ordinary susceptibilities, looking at the mind of a reader. This is wrong because it greatly reduces the level of protection that it afforded to the right of privacy. The mind that has to be examined is that not of a reader in general, but of a person who is affected by the publicity. The question is what a reasonable person of ordinary sensibilities would feel if they were placed in the same position as the claimant and faced with the same publicity. The reasonable person of ordinary sensibilities would also regard publication of a covertly taken photographs and the fact that they were linked with a text in this way as adding greatly overall to the intrusion which the article as a whole made into Miss Campbell's private life. Any person in Miss Campbell's position, assuming them to be of ordinary sensibilities, but assuming also that she had been photographed surreptitiously outside the place where she had been receiving therapy for drug addiction, would have known what they were and would have been distressed on seeing the photographs. They would have seen the publication in conjunction with the article which revealed that they had been when they were photographed and all the details about their engagement in the therapy as a gross interference with her right to respect for her private life. This additional element in the publication is more than enough to outweigh the right to freedom of expression which MGM Limited was asserting in this case. There is therefore via the publication of the article in the mirror, constitution of an infringement of Miss Campbell's right to privacy that cannot be justified and she is therefore entitled to remedy. By a majority ruling of three to two of the law lords, the judges therefore allowed this appeal and restored the order of the first degree judge, Justice Morland. Consequently, the October 2002 decision of the Court of Appeal was reversed the order of Justice Morland restored. In a later judgment on costs from 2004, the House of Lords ordered MGM Limited to pay Miss Campbell's costs in the Court of Appeal and in the House of Lords. Consequently, pursuant to the order of the House of Lords, Miss Campbell's solicitors served three bills of costs to MGM Limited. First one for £377,070.07 for the trial in the High Court. The second one for £114,755.40 for the appeal to the Court of Appeal. 
And the third one for £594,470 for the appeal to the House of Lords for a total of £1,086,285.47. MGM Limited complained to the House of Lords that their right to freedom of expression had been infringed by making them liable to pay £1,086,295.47, as well as their own legal costs, particularly since the award for remedies was solely for £3,500. By petition presented in the House of Lords on the 21st of February 2005, MGM Limited sought a ruling that they should not be liable to pay any part of the success fee provided for in the conditional fee agreement entered into between Ms. Campbell and her retained solicitors and counsel at the stage of the proceedings in the House of Lords on the ground that such a liability was so disproportionate as to infringe their rights to freedom of expression and Article 10 of the Convention. Indeed, £594,470, of which related to the House of Lords appeal, which the solicitors and counsel of Miss Campbell acted on a CFA, a conditional fee agreement, which provided that if the appeal succeeded, solicitors and counsel should be entitled to base cost as well as success fees amounting to 95% and 100% of a base cost, respectively. Thus, the profit element, i.e. the base costs of a legal bill, was £288,468. The success fee, £279,981.35, while the disbursements were £26,020.65. On the 2nd of August 2005, Miss Campbell's solicitors accepted MGM Limited's offers to pay £295,000 high court costs and £95,000 a court of appeal cost, both amounts being exclusive of interests. So it's costing a lot of money to the MGM Limited, to the Mira, this infringement of Naomi Campbell's privacy. So what happened next? Well, in Campbell versus MGM Limited 2005, handed down on the 20th of October 2005, the same five Lords of Appeal for Judgment from the House of Lords in the cause handed down the following judgment. Conditional fee agreements are enforceable, provided that they state the percentage by which the amount of fees which would be payable if it were not a CFA is to be increased, the maximum success fee being 100%. And of the civil procedural rules, the CPR, and the accompanying practice directions, success fees are now, subject to assessment, normally recoverable from the losing party. Section 9.1 of the practice direction of the CPR provided that under an order for payment of costs, the cost payable will include an additional liability incurred under a funding arrangement. And a funding arrangement means a conditional fee arrangement or a policy taken out to ensure against liability to pay the other side's cost after the event insurance. And an additional liability is the success fee or the after the event premium. The impact of a recoverability of success fees lies upon the principle that recoverable costs should have been proportionately and reasonably incurred. The overriding objective set out in 1.1 CPR includes dealing with a case in ways which are proportionate to the amount of money involved, to the importance of the case, to the complexity of issues, and to the financial position of each party. However, the test of proportionality and reasonableness is applied only to basic costs and not to the total sum for which the losing party may be liable after the addition of a success fee. This is explicitly recognized in section 11.5 of the practice direction, which provides in deciding whether the costs are reasonable and on a standard basis assessment proportionate, the court will consider the amount of any additional liability separately from the base costs. In the present case, the House of Lord judges said the challenge is to the allowance of any success fee at all. That challenge is based upon the special position of the media as defendants to actions for defamation and wrongful publication of personal information, such as that brought by Ms. Campbell against MGM Limited. There is a human right to freedom of expression with which the imposition of an excessive cost burden may interfere. 
It is the effect which the threat of heavy liability may have upon the conduct of a newspaper in deciding whether to publish information which ought to be published by which carries a risk of legal proceedings against it. MGM Limited says that in the circumstances of this case, an award of costs increased by a success fee is disproportionate for two reasons. First, they say that it is more than and up to twice as much the amount which under the ordinary assessment rules, a costs judge would consider reasonable and proportionate. Secondly, MGM Limited says that it was not necessary to give Ms. Campbell's access to a court because she could have afforded to fund her own costs as she did at the trial and in the court of appeal. The judges found that these arguments were flawed because it is a matter for parliament and not the UK parliament, not the court, to structure the CFA regime so as to strike a balance between Article 10 from the Convention on the Freedom of Expression and Article 6 of this convention, which is the right to a fair trial. There is nothing in the relevant legislation or practice directions which suggests that a solicitor, before entering into a CFA, must inquire into their solicitor's means and satisfy themselves that they could not fund the litigation themselves. The existing CFA regime with recoverable success fees was compatible with the Convention of Human Rights. The success fee should be allowed. Accordingly, the petition of MGM Limited was unanimously dismissed. From the date of rejection of this second appeal, MGM Limited was liable to pay 8% interest on the costs payable. On the 28th of November 2005, an order for the costs of the second appeal to the House of Lords was made against MGM Limited. Ms. Campbell therefore served an additional bill of costs of £255,535.60 to MGM Limited. The bill included a success fee of 95%, i.e. £85,095.78, in respect of the solicitor's base costs, her counsel having not entered into a CFA for this appeal. MGM Limited challenged the proportionality of the costs and success fees claimed in respect of both appeals to the House of Lords. An assessment hearing was scheduled for 8 of March 2006 before the judicial taxing officers in the House of Lords. On the 3rd of March 2006, MGM Limited agreed with Ms. Campbell's solicitors to pay the sum of £350,000 in respect of the costs claimed in relation to the first appeal. MGM Limited considered it was unlikely to do better before the taxing officers. It wished to avoid accruing interests, 8% per day, and further litigation on costs would lead to further costs and success fees. The hearing on 8 of March 2006 before two judicial taxing officers therefore concerned the costs of the second appeal only. By judgment dated of the same day, the judicial taxing officers found that in these hard fought proceedings ultimately decided by a split decision of the House of Lords, there was no doubt that the success fees, 95 and 100% respectively, claimed in respect of the first appeal to the House of Lords were appropriate having regards to the first and second instance proceedings. Since the second appeal to the House of Lords was part and parcel on the first, the second appeal was covered by the CFA and thus the same success fees. A success fee of 95% for the second appeal to the House of Lords was therefore approved. Relying on rules 44.4 and 44.5 of the CPR, as well as the necessity test, the taxing officers reduced the hourly rates chargeable by Ms. Campbell's solicitors and counsel, therefore reducing the base cost and consequently the success fee payable by MGM Limited. On the 5th of May 2006, MGM Limited appealed to the House of Lords, arguing that the taxing officers' judgment was incorrect insofar as those officers considered that the success fee for the second appeal could not be varied. On the 26th of June 2006, the House of Lords refused leave to appeal. They said no to MGM Limited, no more appeals. On the 5th of July 2007, MGM Limited agreed to pay £150,000, inclusive of interest and assessment procedure costs, in settlement of Ms. Campbell's costs of the second appeal. 
MGM Limited lodged a claim with the European Court of Human Rights for breach of its right to freedom of expression under Article 10 of the Convention. What drama, really? So, in the judgment of MGM Limited versus the United Kingdom, handed down on the 18th of January 2011, the European Court of Human Rights decided that the UK did not breach the right to freedom of expression guaranteed by Article 10 of the Convention of MGM Limited by finding a breach of confidence and a misuse of private information against it. The interference with the right to freedom of expression was prescribed by law, i.e. in this case the UK common law taught of breach of confidentiality for a legitimate aim, i.e. the protection of the rights of others, namely Miss Campbell's right to respect for her private life. This interference was necessary in a democratic society in light of the significant additional distress suffered by Miss Campbell because of the publication of the additional material, i.e. the photographs, the details about the treatment, with Narcotics Anonymous, the unsympathetic second to fourth articles published by the Mirror. The finding by the House of Lords that NGM Limited had acted in breach of confidence did not violate Article 10 of the Convention. However, the requirement to pay the success fees as an unsuccessful defendant in breach of confidence proceedings constituted an interference with MGM's right to freedom of expression guaranteed by Article 10 of the Convention. This interference was prescribed by law within the meaning of Article 10 of the Convention, since the provisions relating to CFAs via calculation of success fees by a percentage uplift and their recoverability from unsuccessful defendant are regulated by the 1990 and 1999 Acts, the Conditional Fee Arrangement Orders 1995 and 2000, as well as the Civil Procedural Rules and relevant cost practice directions. The conditional fee agreement with recoverable success fees sought to achieve the legitimate aim of the widest public access to legal services for civil litigation funded by the private sector and thus the protection of the rights of others within the meaning of Article 10.2 of the Convention of Human Rights. Therefore, the interference had a legitimate aim. However, the interference was not necessary in a democratic society. The requirement that MGM Limited pay success fees to Miss Campbell was disproportionate, having regard to the legitimate aims sought to be achieved and exceeded even the broad margin of appreciation accorded to the UK government in such matters. Accordingly, there has been a violation of Article 10 of the Convention. With respect to MGM Limited's claimed reimbursement of the success fees paid to Miss Campbell following both appeals to the House of Lords, the question of the application of Article 14 of the Human Rights Convention is not ready for decision and accordingly reserves the said question and invites the UK government and MGM Limited to submit within three months of the date of which the judgment be becomes final. They written observations on the matter and in particular to notify the European Court of Human Rights of any agreement that they may reach. What is our analysis? This whole legal saga was a massive boost, massive strengthening of the right to privacy in the UK to the detriment of unbridled freedom of expression by the media. Naomi has had an impact on the fashion industry and the modeling industry as the temporary exhibition at the Victoria and Albert Museum attest, but she also has had a uber effect on UK law as it relates to the right to privacy and the CFA regime and success fee. For the first time in the UK, privacy law has been applied in favour of a person whose privacy has been breached by the House of Lords thanks to the common law tort of breach of confidence and the Article 8 rights to respect for private and family life under the Convention. The cost consequences for MGM Limited have been monstrous, as they were sentenced to pay Miss Campbell's legal costs and fees, which were above £1 million. And if this is where this legal saga gets even more seminal than we initially thought, because thanks to the House of Lords judgment, Campbell versus MGM Limited on the costs from 2005, as well as the European Court of Human Rights judgment, MGM Limited versus the UK, 
the CFA regime and success fees were found in violation of Article 10 of the Convention on Human Rights. These two decisions pushed the UK to reform the current costs and CFA scheme, supporting those campaigning against any level of success fees and even CFAs in defamation and media publication cases. While many press lobbies, such as the Open Society Justice Initiative, cry wolf and lament the fact that excessive legal costs threaten media freedom, it is an expensive but necessary payback lesson for the UK tabloids, which, with undercurrents of racism and alleged righteousness, did not hesitate to vilify Naomi Campbell, reproaching her to have lied to the public by denying that she was a drug user, as if this was anyone's business other than Naomi's, and falsely branding themselves as sympathetic of her seeking treatment for said addiction, while not hesitating to disclose confidential health information about her treatment with Narcotics Anonymous in their rags pages. Teat, but tat, hug them and they wallet, and they will remember the lesson. This is it from us at Crefervy. I hope you enjoyed this foray into privacy law and defamation cases in England and Wales. Bye for now.